Under the Trump administration, for the first time, the federal government executed more people than all states combined in a year. Last year, the federal government executed 10 people versus seven among states. The U.S. is in the company of China, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, and Egypt for countries with the highest execution rates. And since 1950, the federal government has executed 26 people, meaning nearly half of federal executions in recent history occurred in 2020. The federal executions are contrary to this larger trend of declining execution rates in the U.S. as 22 states have already abolished the death penalty and two others haven't executed anyone in 10 years. Three more federal inmates are scheduled to be executed before Trump leaves office later this month, one of them as soon as tomorrow. There's a growing conversation about capital punishment happening in our country, and our guest today is a vocal leader in the movement to abolish it. This is Sounds Good. I'm Brandon Harvey. Today's guest is Shane Claiborne, an activist and author living in Philadelphia. What you need to know most about Shane is that he has a unique approach to living. He is a person who believes in radically simple living. In the late 90s, he and a few friends moved into a low-income neighborhood in Philadelphia and began to support and live among their unhoused neighbors. It eventually turned into a nonprofit called The Simple Way. Shane has also worked with Mother Teresa in India, and visited local bombing victims in Baghdad during the Iraq War. Basically, he walks the walk. Shane is an outspoken critic of the death penalty. He is a Christian faith leader and really well-respected activist in prison reform, and he's going to be at the site of tomorrow's execution, protesting with other prominent activists. I cannot wait for you to hear this conversation with Shane about the possibility and merits of a world without the death penalty and how we can all get involved in making that world a reality. Shane, thank you so much for being here today. I am just really honored and excited to be talking with you. And I understand that I'm catching you right as you're heading off to Terre Haute, Indiana to protest the upcoming federal executions. Yeah, man, it's great to be with you. Thanks for uh, having me. And uh, th- it's one of those uh, things that we we wish we didn't have to think about. A lot of people, you know, it, it's not uh, in, the, in the forefront of their mind, but um, we're seeing these executions happen this next week. So I'll be headed to Terre Haute. We're going to have a bunch of stuff happening on the ground there in Indiana uh, as the executions move forward. But a lot of ways people can join us online too. So we'll talk about that. But I'm um, glad to try to stand up for life and mercy and for alternatives to the death penalty right now. And you have definitely been a big part of my understanding of this. And that's why I'm really glad to be talking about the death penalty with you. And I think this is an important topic that for both good reasons and bad reasons has been getting more attention this year than I can ever remember. And you describe yourself as an abolitionist, meaning that you want to see a complete end to the death penalty. And I kind of want to start off by asking, like, did you always hold those beliefs or how did you come to this point of, of wanting to be an abolitionist and get rid of the death penalty? <laughs> yeah, well, absolutely not. Uh, and it gives me a little <laughs> bit of patience and grace with folks who, you know, see things differently than I do, because I grew up down south and I'm actually still down in North Carolina. We just skinned a squirrel that my nephews uh, shot. So (laughs) I grew up, you know, hunting. I grew up, you know, honestly, Brandon, it was a very narrow uh, way of thinking about what it means to be pro-life, you know, and and I really only thought about that in terms of abortion. And I, I still care passionately about abortion. We're hosting a town hall on abortion later this month on the, the anniversary of Roe versus Wade on January 22nd. But it's not the only issue I care about, you know, and I come, came to see some of the contradictions, especially in evangelical Christianity, where you can say you're pro-life, but still be pro-guns, pro-death penalty, pro-military, you know, <laughs> anti-life on a lot of other things. So I wanted to be more consistent in my ethic of life and not just pro birth, you know, but an advocate for life uh, on on all of these other fronts. Uh, So I'm writing a book about that now, you know, a a more consistent 
ethic of life that's pro-life from womb to tomb that sees that every person is made in the image of God. And, you know, on the death penalty, this is what became really interesting to me is that the death penalty would not stand a chance in America if it weren't for Christians. Uh, literally, uh, Christians have been the base for the death penalty. So the Bible belt is the death belt in America, that literally where Christians are most concentrated, uh, evangelical Christians in particular, like is where the death penalty continues to hang on. Uh, states like, you know, Texas is half, almost half of the state executions that we have every year in that one state. And my home state of um, East Tennessee has been one of the big executing states. Uh, we still use the electric chair in Tennessee. And, and so, you know, some of us haven't really thought a lot about this. It's, it's not uh, an issue that, that a lot of folks are talking about, but the more people start to think about it, the more concern they have. And also the more they see this as connected to other issues, you know, it's, it's impossible to talk about the death penalty divorced from our history of slavery uh, and racism. You know, the, the death penalty, uh, exists in the states that held on to slavery the longest. And literally where executions are happening today is where lynchings were happening a hundred years ago. So the, these issues really connect. And when we talk about the death penalty, it surfaces a lot of other really important things. I love your holistic perspective on life. And I think that you have done a really good job of mobilizing faith communities to make this change because it, you're so right. Like faith communities, or at least evangelical Christianity in the U.S. really does play a significant role in upholding these systems. And by kind of communicating from a faith perspective, you have a real power to create change. And, and I'll say that on a personal level, I definitely grew up with that same you know, thought process on what it means to be pro-life. And certainly that's evolved for me through the years. When it comes to specifically the death penalty, why does the death penalty need to be abolished? What, why is it a priority that we do away with this system? Well, it's, it's a great place to start. And I, I mean, I, th I think some of what we've got to think about is what really heals the wounds of violence. Interestingly enough, you know, when, when people talk about the death penalty, they, they, they often, you know, talk about justice for the victims. And yet one of the things that really changed my heart on this was uh, being with murder victims, family members and survivors of violent crimes that some of them have lost their loved ones. They've survived things I can only imagine. Um, and yet they've walked away feeling like violence is the problem, not the solution. When we think about what's going to heal the wounds of violence, we don't rape people who rape to show that rape is wrong, you know, <laughs> but sometimes we hold out this idea that we're going to kill to show that killing is wrong. And, and the more you look at the death penalty, it really mirrors the kind of vengeance and violence and evil that we're trying to heal the wounds of. And it, it extends the trauma. Uh, it creates new victims. It um, exacerbates the wounds of, of that violence. So I, you know, that's, that's one thing that I think is really important. There's lots of other things. You know, I think when we think about that history around race, it's very clear that this is the descendant, as my friend Brian Stevenson says, uh, you know, this is the direct descendant of lynching and of racism that se back in 1950, African Americans were about 10 percent of our population, but they were 75 percent of the executions. 75. Wow. Now you, you kind of fast forward to now, black folks are about 13% of the overall population, but they still make up almost half of death row. Uh, they're, they're over a third of our executions. And it's clear that there's different versions of justice, you know, for the folks who have resources and those who don't. Um, we kind of think of the death penalty as we're killing the worst of the worst. But what's really apparent as you look closer, is that we're not killing the worst of the worst. We're killing the poorest of the poor and disproportionately uh, people of color. 
And what ends up determining who actually is executed is not the atrocity of the crimes, but it's arbitrary things. For instance, the race of the victim. When the victim is white and the defendant is a person of color, overwhelmingly that that leans uh, the equation towards a, an execution. Uh, where the crime was committed, you know, you get two really different versions of justice. If you do uh, the same crime in Connecticut and in Texas, you know, so I, all of that raises some important questions. And interestingly enough, there's a whole movement of conservatives who are against the death penalty because they're, I mean, for some people it's about money, you know, uh, it costs more to execute someone than it does to put someone in prison for the rest of their life. So there's a lot of conservatives just fiscally that are concerned about it. But, you know, I think that, that what's interesting is it raises the question of how much we trust uh, the government with the, the irreversible power of life and death. And this is one thing we know, Brandon, for every nine executions, there's been one exoneration, one person that has proved their innocence. So that's not a good track record. You know, if every 10 planes that took off, one of them crashed, we'd be like, whoa, we got a problem, you know? Uh, you know, so I think that that question of, of innocence is a big one. And I, you know, there's a, I think we're at 170 people now uh, that have proved their innocence uh, that were sentenced to death. And that that becomes, you know, a, a really big argument for abolishing the death penalty and alternatives, you know, looking for alternatives to the death penalty. Because if you get that one wrong, you, you, know, you, you can't bring someone back, back from the dead. Along those lines, uh, I'd, I'd love to talk a little bit about the context that we find ourselves in in January of 2021. We have upcoming federal executions scheduled that are, for lack of a better word, unique, unprecedented. Can you kind of give some context to the context that we're finding ourselves in right now? And yeah, I guess just what this looks like. I think it's important. A lot of folks, my, myself included, you know, don't know the inner workings of the death penalty in the U.S. And there's there, there's a distinction to be made between the federal executions and state executions, right? We've generally left it up to the states whether or not they have the death penalty, and we're now living in a time where. Uh, across our country, states are moving away from execution. Uh, executions are dropping lower almost every year. They're the lowest they've been in 20 or 30 years. Um, uh, almost every year, a new state abolishes the death penalty. So at that time, you know, in, when it comes to the general public, for the first time in our generation, more people are against the death penalty than are for it. So those shifts are happening. Meanwhile, the federal government has always had this kind of executive power to carry out federal executions, but they use it really, really rarely. So in the past 17 years, we have not had a single federal execution. And yet that all changed in 2020. Donald Trump began uh, and William Barr began executing people at the federal level at a rate that we have not seen since the 1800s. So we had wow. more, more federal executions in 2020 than we've had in, in, in over 50 years combined under Republican and Democrat presidencies, right? So this is, it is unprecedented and it's, Wrenching. I'll, I'll tell you just one other little like caveat of this that is important to note is that some of the requirements for federal execution were expanded because of the legislation that Joe Biden backed, the crime bill that's been really controversial, right? It, it like expanded the crimes that are allowed to qualify for a federal execution. So it's, it's not inaccurate to say that, that some of Biden's legislation paved the way for Trump's executions. And that's why we really want to put this new, you know, Biden-Harris administration, really encourage them to call uh, for an immediate abolition to the federal death penalty and to work to move our entire country away from the death penalty. So that that's important, you know, and, you know, as you look at the profile of who 
is being executed, you see all of the problems uh, that are inherent in the entire, you know, capital punishment system in our country. Uh, for instance, several of the folks that will be executed, uh, I think four out of five of the last executions have been people of color. Several of them have mental uh, intellectual disabilities. The only woman on federal death row and the first woman executed in 70 years is set to be executed on Tuesday, I think right as this is airing. So Lisa Montgomery was abused her entire life, um, sexually, physically. She was, as I understand, forced to be engaged to her stepbrother. I mean, she suffered a life of abuse uh, and, and suffers from mental illness did a terrible crime that you can't even make sense of because of that mental illness. And now, you know, she's facing execution. And there's so many different groups that are saying this is not the best we can do. Her whole life has been a nightmare. It doesn't need to end with a state execution. Uh, and then on top of that, there's Dustin Higgs, who is set to be executed on Martin Luther King's birthday. <laughs> so so we will be in Terre Haute trying to, you know, Martin Luther King said so powerfully that capital punishment is society's final assertion that we will not forgive. So we've got that on an eight foot banner um, kind of, you know, we'll be obviously noting the the sick irony that on Dr. King's birthday, an African-American man who incidentally was not even the person who committed the murder uh, is is facing uh, execution that day. So all, all of those things kind of are culminating. And this is obviously some of the last actions that the Trump administration is carrying out. But the thought that they're going out in the middle of a pandemic, as people are risking their lives, trying to save lives, this administration will go out uh, in its last few days executing um, a record number of people. It's really heartbreaking. And we're going to include uh, some links to some stories about uh, these men and, and this woman who are scheduled to be executed in the show notes for readers to dive a little bit deeper into some of the context here, and especially the heartbreaking story of uh, Lisa Montgomery, um, the Guardian wrote a, a really important piece about that that you shared. Uh, and I found it really helpful to understand the significant mental health struggles that she has had her whole life as the result of abuse. And just seeing that, like, it, I, it, it's just really heartbreaking. And so I guess in the context of the protest that you have in the coming days, what is your short-term hope or goal with these protests? Uh, and then maybe zooming out a little bit, you know, you're talking about pushing uh, the Biden administration to create policy change. What are kind of some of the longer term goals that you have uh, that you're hopeful that protesting will affect? Yeah, so we, we're going to have uh, a number of things happening on the ground in Terre Haute, and folks are welcome to join us uh, there. If, if, you know, we'll have masks, all kinds of uh, coronavirus protocols that we'll have in place to try to keep people safe. But because of the urgency, there are some folks that want to be there on the ground, you know, every day having protests and prayer vigils as these executions move forward. But many of us can't be in Terre Haute. I'm sure some of your listeners are international and vulnerable to the pandemic. So we're having a whole bunch of events that will be happening online. You know, mostly what we're doing, Brandon, is trying to amplify the voices of people that have been directly impacted. So there will be folks that were wrongfully sentenced to death and prove their innocence that we'll be sharing. We'll have executioners who carried out executions that really became profoundly impacted in thinking that we've got to find alternatives to execution, that this is just wrong, you know, and that doesn't mean that you're against justice. Uh, we've got murder victims, family members uh, that will be sharing about why violence is the problem, not the solution. And we can honor the victims of murder without the death penalty and creating new victims. So that's all. You, you, the best place to go is deathpenaltyaction.org. That's the big umbrella that's bring it kind of a coalition that's bringing all these groups together. I'm optimistic, brother. I'm, I'm, I'm really excited. I mean, every one of these executions is too many. But what we're seeing is a, a new generation that just is so profoundly offended by the death penalty and violence in so many different forms, you know. So uh, a recent poll showed that 
millennials are, you know, over 80% of them against the death penalty. You know, among Christians, a growing number of Christians are against the death penalty. Uh, Americans in general were polled, and this was an interesting, Brandon, they they asked Americans, would Jesus be for the death penalty? And 95% of Americans said, no, Jesus. Wow. But they just, they were like, we just got to convince the Christians of that. <laughs> <laughs> So as the result of these protests, do you expect that there's a chance that these executions could be canceled and, and transitions to life sentences? Like what what does that look like short term? Or is it more so that this is an opportunity to have this conversation that will save more lives in the future? Well, well you, this is the thing is... Uh, Lawyers are on the front front line trying to stop these executions. I mean, we're 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 going to do. I've got a quote on my wall that says, "If the forces of death come to kill someone and they don't have to cross over our bodies, then we should question our, <laughs> you know, our conscience and our faith." And so that that's, that's a big call. But I think that what we want to do is do everything we can to raise our voice because what we are literally looking at is premeditated murder. Right. It's, it's interesting because on the death certificate of someone who is executed, the manner of death is listed as homicide. We know wow. that it's literally like that's what goes on their death certificate. And I think of the words of Cyprian, one of the, the bishops and the great thinkers in the early church. And he said, when an individual kills another individual, we call it evil as we should. But why do we sanctify it when the state does it and call it good? So we, I think there's, there's a number of us that think, you know, killing is wrong, no matter whether it's done by a criminal or by a governor or a president. And, and that's what we want to really raise our voices uh, around. And, uh, um, of course, Dr. King, who, you know, will remember his birthday as one of these executions is, is happening. And he said, the church is not meant to be the servant or the master of the state. The church is meant to be the conscience of our nation. So we want to be there to try to stir the conscience of our country and to say, it does, it doesn't need to be this way. We can deal with evil people or people who have done evil, people who have done terrible things without the, the death penalty, without killing them. And uh, when it comes to the rest of the world, when I was born, Brandon, I think there were only like, I won't tell you how long ago. Yeah, well, it was <laughs> 1975. I think it was only 16 countries that had abolished the death penalty. And that number is now at like 107. Most of the world has abolished the death penalty. And the U.S. is really an outlier. I mean, the, the countries that still execute their own people, the, these are them. Number one is China. Iran, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, uh, and then the U.S. is usually in the top five and always in the top 10. So that's not the best company to keep. I think there's a lot of us that go, we want to be on the right side of history. And I I'm convinced a generation from now, people are going to look back at the death penalty like we look back at slavery, you know, thinking this was horrific and shameful. And how in the world did we use the Bible to justify it? Before we take a quick break, I want to wrap up by hopefully casting some vision for what this better future could look like. Because you've left me feeling very hopeful about the possibility of change. But sometimes it's easier to enact change when you can have a vision for what a better future would, would look like and feel like. And so what is a helpful and, dare I say, like beautiful alternative to the death penalty? What could we have as a viable alternative? At the end of each chapter of my book on this, Executing Grace, I have stories about restorative justice, you know, where we've seen that work. And I'm convinced that, you know, one of the biggest obstacles to um, alternatives to the death penalty is just our imagination, right? Our ability to imagine other forms of justice. And, and, and so you look to some of these countries that are ahead of us in many ways on this. When uh, apartheid fell in South Africa, they set up, you know, the new South Africa and created a new constitution, but it had no room for the death penalty because that was all 
a part of the past that they wanted to move forward from in places where there's been horrific violence, like in uh, Rwanda, uh, you know, one of the worst genocides of our generation. They walked away from that with these truth and reconciliation commissions, right? To name the evil that was done. And, but the people who committed that evil, they created ways that they can try to heal those wounds. And that's a restorative justice, right? One biblical scholar, a friend of mine said the best translation for the biblical notion of justice, which is always connected to righteousness. The best translation for that is restorative justice because it's about setting things right that were made wrong. It's about healing the wounds of violence and evil and sin in the world. And, you know, when we think of that, um, our criminal justice system is asking a whole different set of questions. It's often saying, what did they do wrong and what punishment do they deserve for that crime? And restorative justice is asking something different. It's going, what harm was done? And what is truly going to heal uh, those wounds and undo that harm? And obviously you can't bring someone back from the dead, but we can allow the person who committed evil to uh, participate in trying to heal some of those wounds. So stories like the ones I tell in Executing Grace, they've inspired me to think of like, what could real justice look like, even in the case of murder? It's such a powerful thing to imagine. And I love thinking about what that future could look like. Uh, We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, Shane is going to lay out how you can get involved in reforming our justice system. Sounds Good is sponsored by Libro FM. Libro FM is the first and only company that lets you purchase audiobooks directly from your favorite local bookstore. So in addition to having access to more than 150,000 audiobooks, I also get to support local and help a small business I care about keep its doors open. As a special offer for Sounds Good listeners, Libro FM is offering two audiobooks for the price of one with your first month of membership with the code GOOD. If you're interested in diving in deeper to this conversation around the death penalty, may I recommend your first two books being two of my favorites, Executing Grace by Shane Claiborne and Just Mercy by Brian Stevenson. All you have to do is visit the website Libro.fm, that's L-I-B-R-O dot F-M, and use the promo code GOOD to get started with two audiobooks and to help support this show. Sounds Good is sponsored by BetterHelp. The last few weeks have been really challenging for a lot of people between coming back to work after the holidays, a continued global pandemic, and everything we've been seeing in the news. It's so understandable to feel overwhelmed. And you need someone to talk to. BetterHelp makes it easy to get matched with your own licensed professional therapist. All you have to do is answer a few questions and they'll get you matched and ready to start in under 48 hours. BetterHelp is more affordable than traditional offline counseling. Plus, you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions from anywhere in the world. Visit betterhelp.com good and join over 1 million people, myself included, who have taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. BetterHelp is offering a special offer for Sounds Good listeners to get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash good. That's better, H-E-L-P dot com slash good. I guess to sum up this whole conversation, what is a great way for people to get involved? And specifically... I'd like to ask you to share a small thing that every listener interested in abolition can do today, as well as bigger action steps that might require hopping on a plane or might require calling a representative or might require doing something not just once, but over the course of weeks or months. But maybe we'll start small. What's something that that every listener interested in abolition can do today? 
Absolutely. And, and first, because this is right in the middle of uh, this spree of federal executions, I want to invite everybody to go to our website, deathpenaltyaction.org, and join what we're doing to resist these executions. The people that have the power this week are Donald Trump and the Attorney General Rawson. So let's write them. Let's call them. I mean, the time is of the essence right now. But then let's also think bigger, right? So let's let's go ahead and invite Biden and Harris to even in the first hundred days uh, that they're in office to call a moratorium on executions and an end. They have the power to move the, the envelope on this to end the federal death penalty. We all have a government right now that is kind of carrying out these executions in our name. So let, let's do that. And then let's use our voices in the state to state campaigns. So uh, each state is nuanced. It's a little different. There's some states that have fully abolished the death penalty. There's others that have like my where I'm living in Pennsylvania. We still have the death penalty on the books, even though we haven't had an execution in 20 years. So we need to close the door on it. You know, let, let's just say we, we don't ever need to reopen, uh, you know, executions, restart executions again. So check out your state. If you're looking for a great place to go just to get more information, there's a whole information center called the Death Penalty Information Center. So it can tell you where your state's at and, and what groups are working around this there. Um, and then, you know, if you haven't checked out Executing Grace, uh, I'd invite you to, to check it out, mostly because what I did in my book is interview people. Uh, I have a whole section of executioners that are haunted by the executions that they carried out, murder victims, family members, a chapter on the innocents, uh, the, you know, the, the folks that were wrongfully convicted. So you can see a lot of those groups on our website. Let's support them. Let's amplify the voices of those whose lives are at stake. And let's do that in a way that never trivializes the pain of the victims of violent crime and murder, those, those murder victims, family members. It's, it's those folks that have so much credibility when they say that violence is the problem, it's not the cure. That's activist and author Shane Claiborne. You can learn more about Shane's work by visiting his website, shaneclaiborne.com. That's Shane Claiborne, C-L-A-I-B-O-R-N-E.com. You can also follow him on Twitter at Shane Claiborne. You can get involved in protesting against the death penalty at deathpenaltyaction.org. We've also included links to some of the articles we mentioned in the podcast show notes for further reading. This podcast was created by Good Good Good. At Good Good Good, we help you feel more hopeful and do more good. You can find more good news and ways to make a difference in our weekly email newsletter, our beautiful print good newspaper, or online at goodgoodgood.co. This episode was created by Kaylee Thompson, Megan Burns, Chad Michael Snavely, and me, Brandon Harvey. Please do us a favor by leaving a review wherever you listen to podcasts. Hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single episode. And when you find an episode you love, please share it on Instagram so more people can find good news. And with that, that is a wrap for this week's episode. Go out and do one thing to make a difference in supporting justice system reform. And we'll be back next week with more good news and good action. Sound good?